Now, just take those differences and then, and then recognize that we're talking about two very different systems. The one system says, you are an isolated individual. We will pay for an impersonal bureaucracy. It will automatically maintain you. If you have a good sob story, we'll automatically sympathize with you. We would never dream of requiring you to work. We expect you to become dependent. And your spiritual life is your own problem, and of course we're not going to talk to you about it. The other model says, we believe you're part of some kind of extended affiliation with other human beings. We want to bond with you as a human being. We want to understand your problems enough to help you solve your unique problems. We're prepared to be very tough-minded with you because we actually like you enough to say no to you. We're going to require that you work so you have a sense of dignity. We're going to emphasize the importance of your remaining free and not becoming dependent. And we believe that your spiritual life is as important as your physical life. Now, you, it's, as I said earlier about holistic, it's pretty hard to get a broader gap in the two models at the core of the two cultures. And then, of course, you start building a system that reflects the cultural values. So we've built a government structure that punishes work, that gives away money automatically in an anonymous manner. But if you're going to change the values, then you've got to shift the whole structure. Because one of the arguments of the reformers is, if you create an anonymous way for people to maintain themselves as they decay, a significant number of people will do just that. Because to be changed is hard. Again, I can't overstate this. None of the reformers believed this was easy. And they all said, if you create in here a center of public support that makes it easy to avoid change, people will simply destroy themselves. They won't automatically change. The people only change when, in fact, they have very few choices. And so you've got to decide whether or not you're willing to tolerate the cost of allowing people to continue to decay. The essence of, of the Olasky model is that personal strength is inherently spiritual and explains why private charities rather than governments must be the primary helpers of the poor. That if in fact you're really going to have the level of personal involvement we're talking about, first of all, you could never hire enough bureaucrats to do it. You have to have volunteers. Second, you have to have a voluntary relationship because the government represents power on such a scale that if you gave the government this kind of power, you'd be creating a potential dictatorship. So you can't afford to have a government that can interfere in your private life on this scale. It would be intolerable. So if you're going to have people who are actually out here being that detailed in their interest in your life, it had better be private sector. And you better have the option to say no. Now, when you say no, there's a consequence. They don't have to give you food. They don't have to nurture you. You better go find somebody else to play your game with. But it's a very, very different model. Lastly, what it says, in terms of you as a healthy person with a pretty good life, your personal strength is more important than your money. Now what the system really needs is not another hundred billion dollars. It needs about 50 million Americans who are willing to do something as a human being. But that enough, enough Americans who are healthy, who are work oriented, who do have pretty good habits, enough Americans willing to reach out and just help one person. Don't, don't try to save Atlanta or don't try to save Washington or don't try to save Waleska, uh, try to save one person. That the difference you can make in that process is enormous. Now if you save one person, then, then hopefully you'll, you'll go on to another person and you'll challenge the one you saved when they're on their feet that they'll help somebody too. Because what you began to build was an extended chain of goodwill. Where people felt, look, people helped me when I was young, I'd better help somebody else. I will repay. Remember, remember the way Golden described it. He said, uh, America gave them all hope and life, and they repaid America. There has never been a more even trade. And so in a sense, if everybody who is well, doing well, would then say, I'll help somebody, but then when I help you, you help somebody, you create a gradually, a pretty rapidly expanding cavalcade of people helping each other. Okay? Comments, questions? Well, let's go back to this one. If, if we are incentive-based, what is the possible incentive for these inner-city kids to lay down their guns and their drugs for the money that they're making? 
I mean, here we're going to go and offer them an eight-hour a day job where they can make three First times as much sure. selling a horse on the I mean, a, they won't, a, they won't die. Yeah. B, B, shame beats cash. We, don't we don't see shame. Really. No, no that's, but that's the point. That's why you make the transition. I mean, read the life of Malcolm X. I mean, it's one morning people say, I, I mean, this is what Adam Smith meant when he talked about the man in the mirror in, in uh, the theory of moral sentiments. Inside all of us except the most psychotic. I mean, there are some people who are psychotic. So those people you, frankly, just lock up for life. That's the lesson of, of uh, the silence of the lambs, is, is that uh, the doctor who ate people should not have been let out. It was a bad decision. <laughs> okay? Uh, Hannibal, Hannibal, Le Hannibal Lecter, right? Okay, and yes, it is true. I am for the death penalty for Hannibal Lecter if they ever capture him. The um, point here is, one, most human beings have an internal compass. What, what, what Smith said was the man in the mirror, the woman in the mirror. Where you look in the mirror, are you really happy being that person? Two, you want to raise the disincentive for illegal behavior. You want to make it dramatically harder to sell drugs and to get away with those kind of things. But three, most, most girls don't turn to prostitution even though it pays. Most, kid, most young men don't turn to drug running even though it pays. Even in the poorest neighborhoods in America, there is a minority doing bad things. In the poorest neighborhood, the vast majority of people are decent people who want a chance to earn a living, who want self-respect, and who want to live as a neighborhood. And so you, what you've got to do is reestablish the legitimacy and the authenticity. And, and uh, what somebody said the other day is reestablishing shame. I mean, when you can turn to somebody who is, who is staggering down the street as a drunk and say, that is shameful. You shouldn't let your children see you like that. You've begun to make the transition from this to this. And in a sense, at one level, I deliberately use the square. Because, of course, this was a joke in the 50s and early 60s, to be square. Well, it turned out to not be square may mean doing other things that hurt. <laughs> we will be back in uh, about 10 minutes, I reckon. I'm told we have to take a break. Or they'll yell at us.